Mm-hmm. So when did it happen to where the romance came into y'all friendship? I love this because this is about to be so Tasha. One night I just told him, I said, you got feelings for me. <laughs> <laughs> he cannot stand when I tell that story. I said, I did. I said, you have feelings for me. Now, how were bold you, is that? Were, Why can't I just say I got feelings for you? Because you, you had to project it. And that was good that you did it like that. I sure did. Because it wasn't like you were pursuing him. You made him confess his own. <laughs> that he wanted to pursue me. Right? I helped him out. You helped I gave him, him some you help. Gave, you gave him an alley-oop. <laughs> and you said, you told him, you told him uh, he you had got feelings for me. what he said? He could not disagree. I said, I, I think we need to discuss this. We're going to have to talk about this. <laughs> It was the truth. Look at us now. Come on, seven <laughs> years down the road. <laughs> Ladies, that's Ladies, a little tip. Yeah, tell them. Tell you're not, you're tell not being too aggressive. You're just like helping. It's you, helping. We you, called to be helped. <laughs> we called to help, right? Yeah, y'all want me to help me. Yeah. And so you told him how he felt about you. Yes. <laughs> and he and said. he couldn't disagree. Every second that escapes without you here with me. Keeps my heart anticipating till I finally see. When I made my vows, I told God that I was going to take care of this gift. All my life I've been waiting for you. Girl, you know I've been praying for you. Been writing these love letters to you. So I fight for that future in the present. That's you know what I'm saying? That was good, Ken. to the ones who found love For the whole band new beginnings From heaven above I await my future wifey I pray that it won't be too long Too long Every second that it- Welcome to the Dear Future Wifey Podcast. I'm your host, Latera Sar Whitfield. Listen, are you still shacking up with us? If you're still shacking up with us, come on, can we get a commitment? Hit that subscription button and subscribe. Make sure you turn on your notification bell so you'll be notified about upcoming episodes. Listen, this season has been absolutely amazing. I've been reading all the comments on YouTube, all the DMs. Um, Man, thank y'all so much for uh, joining me on the Love Blueprint Masterclass. Um, Gosh, that was so healing for all of us. Well, let me tell you something. I, I, you know, I'll be saying some prayers on my podcast. I mean, you know, when I launched this in 2020, I had some specific people that I wanted to talk to on the podcast. And let me tell you, God heard my prayers. And so without further ado, welcome to the Dear Future Wifey podcast. My homie, Tasha Cobbs Leonard. How you doing, What's queen? Up? We in this thing. We in Finally this thing. Finally made it. Finally made it. But you, wow. but you came without your husband. Where he at? Listen, uh-huh. I ain't going to tell you who, but they canceled his flight. I ain't going to say no yeah, We ain't going to throw the airline on the bus because I might need y'all to sponsor one of my podcast episodes. Right, or right. They ain't going to say no names. They ain't going to say no they names. They canceled the man's flight this morning. He said he was ready, huh? He yeah. said he had prepared. So I get to tell all the stories my way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoy this. Well, listen, man. I told you when you came in um, that I worked with you when I did, you know, during my season as a national playwright, director, mm-hmm. producer, I did a production uh, for Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship. Yes. And and um, you graced the stage, and of course, you sang "Break Every Chain." Mm-mm, come on, let me tell you something. <laughs> Did you ever believe that that song would be as big as it became? You know what? I have a story behind that song. The I knew that it would impact people's lives the way that it did. How did you know? I that? did not because I, I personally experienced it myself. The testimony behind that song is one night I was down south in Georgia. I'm from Georgia. And me and my team had done a concert in like Warner Robins, Georgia, something like that. And I was driving. I like to drive. So I'm driving everybody, everybody else snoring. (laughs) I'm driving. And in that season, I was really dealing with deep depression and anxiety and fear during that time. And not a lot of people knew it. So while I was driving, I would just have a playlist playing and this song Break Every Chain came on and immediately it started to just chip away at this dark season that I was in. And so I would listen to it for 24 hours for like the next two weeks, nonstop, nonstop. 
And that was how I began my healing towards freedom from that season of depression. So people ask me all the time, do you get tired of singing it? No, I don't, because I know what that song in particular can do in your life. I'm a living testimony. So the testimony behind that song is that's the reason why I can sing it the way I do. I want to ask you then, because I know as an artist, you've heard probably tons of testimonies surrounding Mm -hmm. that song. What what kind of feedback have you heard? What kind of testimonies? Oh, I mean, everything from healing, miraculous healing to people being set free from, like I just said, dark seasons of depression and fear. Um, It's uh, families being mended. Like I I remember um, a a husband so I get these don't now don't send me DMs y'all but I check them sometimes yeah 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 and sometimes I'll get these testimonies and this one just stood out to me there was a husband who was in the hospital very very sick and the wife chose to play break every chain in his bedroom non-stop experience complete healing in that in that house like those they just stand, and that one is probably about nine ten years old but i never forget these testimonies and i have them in the back of my head every time i'm singing that song and i have an expectation that when this song is released in a room somebody is about to get a miracle you yeah. said i have an expectation yeah i do so you don't get up on stage you sing that song just like another song on the oh, set list oh no you say i when i sing this song mm-hmm. i need for an encounter to yes. take place. Yep, yep. I, I have an expectation. And sometimes I have to remind the room that, hey, this is not our favorite song from the radio. It's not a, a cool little jingle. Like, this is a declaration and we expect God to do something when we sing it. Yeah. For real. For Tasha, real. can I trouble you to have you sing a little snippet of it? There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. So what made you, so when you recorded it, was it a moment in the studio where you were crying while you recording it or what happened? Or was you just trying to just perfect in the studio? Like what, what happened on the recording? It was a live, it was a live recording. So, um, that album is Grace. That's the album. Yep. It has Break Every Chain, Confidence, Happy, all those songs mm-hmm. on there. Um, it was the one song that we were sold on. Like everything else, I was like, hey, we might have to write some stuff. But <laughs> this song is going to be the one that was. So it was the one song that we were fully sold. This is going to be on this album. And in the room in that moment, the same thing I feel now, 12 years later, when we sing that 12 song. 12 years later is literally what happened in the room in that moment. We could barely move on. <laughs> like, we could barely move on. Yep. Uh, Do we need to get our tissues already? Because I feel well, like this no. is about to Well, I'm just sitting over here. It's over <laughs> here. Because I'm just, I'm just thinking about, I'm just going back in my mind mm-hmm. about even when I first heard that yeah. song. And it's like, it's one of those songs that truly arrest you. Yeah. It's like, you, can, you can't listen to that song. It's just like, oh, this is a cool little song. And you mm-hmm. just start singing it like a jingle no. or something. No, uh-uh. when, you, when you hear it, it makes you reflect on every stronghold that the enemy has mm-hmm. placed on your mind, on your family, wow. generational curses. Yeah. And I, I remember listening to that song and I, you know, having the privilege to hear you sing it live in a play mm-hmm. that I wrote and I'm sitting up there listening and I'm going, wow. wow. And then the graphic behind you, we put these little chains that just kept spinning around oh, wow. and they were broken links and stuff. And I was sitting there listening. I was like, this girl is wow. bad. Like, it's just, it's just, yeah, it's just, yeah, I, I don't, I don't want to stay on that because it's going, it's going, <laughs> we ain't going to get through the interview because. I remember that though. Yeah, it's these I remember moments. That. It's these encounters that take place and that's why Gospel music is not like any other music, Mm-mm. you know, um, and it's just it's just a powerful thing, which is interesting. It just it just dawned on me. Um, do you get controversy when you begin to collaborate with other secular artists? Because I remember you collaborated with uh, Nicki Minaj on the mm-hmm. song. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, what was the thought process behind that? For sure. I don't know if it's so much thought as it is obedience. Like uh, there, there, I'll I'll say something about me. I'm not walking through a door that God didn't provide for me. I'm not going to stand on any platform that he didn't tell me to stand on. I am not going to do anything with this ministry that he's entrusted me with, that he has not given me instruction, instruction to do. So it's less of thinking and more of obedience. And I have this thing, Kenny, if Kenny was here, he would tell you, I, before I could think of logical reasons to give God a no, I just go ahead and say yes. (laughs) Like, <laughs> so people ask me all the time, well, how did you start that business today? What made you do that? I just said yes before I could think of a reason to say no. And before you know it, you out in the middle of the water. You can't turn around. <laughs> you said That's the I, before, best advice. Before I think of logical reasons to say no. I just go ahead and say, yeah, I'll do it. 
Yeah. And so even with those the, those um, collaborations, like I have collaborations with Sierra and, and Common. And I mean, you know, and, and it's it's all divinely orchestrated by God that that we reach a, 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 a people who may not come to our churches. You know, I remember the first song that I because we have me and Nikki got two songs. Yeah, now, I, I did two. one of her, her yeah. album that just came out called Blessings. And it's really been a blessing to people. But that first song, I remember we were recording my album, Heart, Passion, Pursuit. And we were in the studio. And back then, I was just posting clips like just you know y'all hear this song we're about to do we're about to I'm just excited yeah. right and so Nikki sees one of the clips to the song I'm getting ready and she sends me a message because we we communicated often we, oh, so we actually knew each have other? a friendship yes. okay so y'all knew each other before yes. y'all start working together absolutely okay. so she said hey when you finish this song I'm getting ready send it to me and I'm gonna put 16 bars on it and immediately I thought she has got to be kidding me right and so I'm texting like are you sure she was like send it to me I'm gonna put 16 bars on it and um, <laughs> she said to me this will be the first opportunity that I have to expose my relationship with God to my followers and I want to do it on your album she said that to me See? so who am I to say See, there you go. this person can't worship God there you go you're starting too soon I I'm trying, to, yeah, because because now now see you're making my tear ducts start yeah. acting up. Yeah, because we have a bit. We, <sighs> who am I to like like even what you just said? She says I want to expose yeah. my relationship with God to my followers. Yeah, and a lot of times people it don't look like how it quote unquote should look like yeah. as you know, and how I say, we should, want it to look. yeah, yeah. yeah. How, how we want. And, and you don't understand someone's journey. And yes. I always say, if you talk to Paul, Come you know, when he was, now. when he was Saul, yeah. you'd be like, Oh, Ooh. he's the devil. I don't want nothing to do with you. And mm -hmm. he's a great person that God used in the Bible. One but encounter, one encounter, one encounter. And we don't never think about what if we are that encounter, that encounter. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was it was an immediate yes for me. Like everything in my spirit said yes. What, know, what, this, so this what did the label say? The label say, uh, did you have anybody no, with pushback? They was like, I, thank you, this not is Jim. But you know, after the release, of course, I mean, people, it was an uproar <laughs> because it took us a while to release like the the list of songs on it. And I think one night I was like, okay, this is a night. I told the label we're gonna do it. So we released all of the songs, which that album just it it. It broke so many records. Yes. It just, it just it took on a life of its own. Yeah. You know, outside of the Nikki and the I'm getting ready, it was just a great album. And I, when we put out, I'm getting ready, and it had Nicki Minaj on there. Oh my goodness! That next morning, <laughs> I listen. Social media was in an uproar. Y'all had y'all selves in a jumble. You hear me? <laughs> But you know what? I, I believe that I had equipped myself for it mentally. So it didn't do nothing to you. It just, it just. No, like, I won't ever say it doesn't do okay. anything. Right. You know, I, I think, and, and I can't speak for everybody, but for me, we we are human. Yeah. And you can read 20,000 comments that's for you. That's like, you read oh, two of them. You like, oh, God. They, two they, comments they don't like that say, me. oh, they don't like Lord, me. you know, you got, you need therapy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it, it, I believe I have placed myself in a mental space where I prepared for it. You know, you know, you can brace yourself for something, yeah. but you still feel the blow. You know, that's that's how I was. But never once did I question whether it was the will of God. Not once. So how did you combat it? What were some things that you said that did you even make any statements publicly about it? I did not. I, th I may have did one. I don't, Cause I don't, I don't even think nothing. I did. I, you know, I that was one of the things I, I grew up Pentecostal holiness. You know, you had a statement, let the Lord fight your battles. <laughs> I, I really felt like that was something that. In my spirit, I felt like God would be the one to make the statement. You know, just like, you know, I think of the story with Mary and Martha, where Martha's like, hey, you need to work, 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 work. She, she's sitting there and yep. Jesus is like, he spoke up for Mary. She didn't have to say anything. Mar yeah. Martha was doing all this, this complaining and Mary didn't have to say a thing. Jesus spoke up for her and I felt like he was going to speak up for me. And right now I could show you DMs of people who were who was like in 2017, you know, I didn't understand what you were doing and I apologize. I, re I have so many yes. messages of people who have seen how that song has impacted so many people's lives, you know, and so I feel like the Lord fought the battle. Yeah. <laughs> But in the midst of it, you get this big song. Um, mm -hmm. 
have you has it been of course you're going to say no names but has it been other artists that have reached out to you that the holy spirit told you not to record a song with absolutely <laughs> absolutely so you ain't just saying yes before you yeah. say no you ain't just saying yes to everything uh, right 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 um uh, yeah there have been yeah and and it, it's because you know they, they have to, it has to be aligned with what god has called you to do yeah you know so i i feel like you can't just jump out there and do everything. So I say, I give God a yes. Yeah. Before I can think of a reason to say no, not everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so how has your relationship journey been? Um, you got married. Um, seven years now. Seven years ago. Did you feel like you had been married sooner? Like, you know, a lot of women in their 20s, they'd be mm -hmm. like, I'm going to be married by 25, you mm -hmm. know? And then after 25, it's just progressively gets more discouraging. And when they hit 30, it's like, I'm not married yet. And so yeah. they start getting very discouraged. Was that your journey? This might not be a popular answer, but it's my answer. I, I felt like I would be married, but the details were foggy. Like I never could put my finger on when it would be, how it would be, or who it would be. I had one, one, um, one request of God is that the person that I would marry would know me before the Tasha Cobbs that really? everybody else knew. Mm -hmm. But you, you had that request before you ever knew you was going to be the Tasha Cobbs that everybody else would know? Well, my, I, it had been <laughs> prophesied to me for, for my entire life. Okay, so, <laughs> okay. You know, the, the, the word of prophecy that had come to me, it was my prayer that whatever God would do with my life, my husband would know the me that my family knows. That that Tasha, that little tot tot, little tot tot. <laughs> so, what was prophesied to you early on? Well, from my mom, I, there's one that stands out to me specifically that really came to pass. My mother was like an intense worshiper, so I say all the time. I grew up in a Pentecostal holy church, so we shouted and shouted and praise, praise, praise. But my mother was more like a crier. She would just be the one in the corner, hands lifted, and we were like, "Oh, that lady right there, she's so deep." <laughs> but it, it worked in our family. My dad was a oh, praiser, so he yeah. was like a preacher. He stood up in the pews, you know. <laughs> All that, and uh, I remember one day my mother was driving home. She used to work at Fort Stewart, Georgia. Um, she worked on the label base for a, a while, and um, she came home. She sat in the garage for like thirty minutes, just out there worshiping and crying. And when she got out the car, she came inside and she said, "The Lord spoke to me. And he said that people will know your name before they know your face." And um, when I go back to the video, it's, this makes me tear yeah. of, of me winning the Grammy seven days after my father went to be with the Lord. People did not know my face. When they said Tasha Cobbs, everybody was looking around like, who is that? You know, like, who? where is she? Because we've heard this song, Break Every Chain. We've all been singing it in our churches, but we don't know what she looked like. And so <laughs> when I got crazy. up, that was my mother's, the word she had given me coming to pass it. People will know your, they will know your face, your name before they know your face. And so many prophecies have come to pass like that. Like, I see your name in lights. But a lot of people, and I love that. I love that God would keep me hidden behind him. Like, it's never been about. You better quit playing. <laughs> Don't you start preaching. And I want to keep it, you know, keep it that way. It's not about me. It's always been about him in the forefront. Yep. Your so, mama. She's such prophesied. a sweet lady. See, I thought you were about to say you was at some revival and some oh, prophet call, came yeah, in. Yeah, that, yeah, that didn't happen too. Yeah, and then prophesied <laughs> that over you, but your mama. Yes, that's different. That's different. That's different. That's different. Because mm -hmm. you came from her. Yep. And I believe that as parents, and, and, and now since you've been a parent you're going, you're going to experience all that mm -hmm. is that where God, you experience a download on God where he begins to show you your uh, child and the trajectory yes. of their life, you know, uh, in the before place. So wow. you'll get a chance to see it and you'll be like, hmm, and then you'll mm -hmm. just watch it just play itself Develop, out. Because yeah. I used to say God was the biggest snitch on me. God used to tell, <laughs> God, man, God used to tell my mom all kind of stuff. I'd be like, what? I, I mean, I'd be doing something, I ain't got no business. My uh -huh. mama walking there, she said, what goes on in the dark comes to the light. Come like, on. What are you talking Come about? Oh, mama. And then she'd tell me what I was doing, and I'd be like, "How she know this?" Yes. And she said, "Baby, you don't know I pray." Yeah, I talked to God. And he talked to me about you, man. Right. Let me tell you something. Mm -hmm. I didn't believe it. I didn't know until it just kept showing up, mm -hmm. and so it taught me to have a heart posture behind my kids of that. prayer. Yeah. Um, as you, so you never knew the time, the season, mm -hmm. or when you were going to get married, the age, no. who it was, what profession he was going to be yep. in, and you just said. 
for whatever reason, you said yeah. you wanted him to know the Tasha, the Tata, mm -hmm. be, before that person, before the fame and everything else. Yep. Why yep. did you feel like that? You know, I just, I, I wanted it to, I wanted to be sure that this is, you love me. You don't love everything else that's connected to the name, yeah. but you truly love me. And God, and God answered that prayer. How did, you meet that prayer. how did you meet that How did we meet? I get to tell my story. All by Kenny yourself. Leonard. Kenny, 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 Kenny can't come and debate it. I'll give you an opportunity right. to come on the podcast and you can debate it later or whatever. Right, because a little, there's some little <laughs> nuances in there. Uh, so I met Kenny. I, I was going to a worship conference in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, Teresa Harrison used to have a worship conference called uh, Gospel Heritage. So we were going to Gospel Heritage and I was there with William Murphy. He was singing that night. And so William Murphy was up teaching a class. His class went over time. I'm telling the truth right now. Go ahead, tell the truth. Tell class truth. went over time. He looks at me and he says, Todd, I need you to go do my rehearsal. So at the time I was serving as the worship pastor at the Dream Center in Atlanta um, under Bishop William Murphy. And, and so I went and I said, okay, I'm going to do this. I already didn't want to be there. He woke us up four o'clock that morning. It's like we're going to Charlotte. I didn't want to be there. I was agitated. I was also in that season of depression and I told you about what, so, so what I, year was this this was 20 2009 2009 I had all of these walls up you know I just it, I was in an emotional space that was unhealthy already and uh, so I went in and I was like oh lord y'all singing the wrong version of uh, praises what I do who's in charge here I'm like <laughs> now Kenny his story is I slammed doors there was no door <laughs> There was no door. There was no door inside? No. Kitty was like, what church don't have a door? <laughs> so, so anyway, so I walked in. I was like, Who is, who's in, the, in charge here? You're doing the wrong version of the song. So he stands up. Hi, my name is Kenneth Leonard. All calm. He was like, anything that you need, we'll make sure that we fix it. By it by the time it's time for you to minister tonight. So I was like, who is this guy? Because you your energy need to meet my energy. You know, if I'm in an uproar, <laughs> he needs to be an uproar. He needs to be up here. Everybody needs to be frantic. At, you know, and I've always said from that moment until this one, he's the calm to my storm. He is, <laughs> it, it could be going crazy. He's always gonna be settled, always gonna be calm. So so I say, you know, y'all singing the wrong version of the song. He's like, well, okay, we'll fix it. He handed me his business card, and I was like, who is this guy you know in the band everything by the time we got there that night everything was fixed I mean Bishop Murphy got up people could not get off the floor and worship it was just great and after that it was this was during MySpace time so Kenny sent MySpace. A, yeah he sent a MySpace uh, message to me and he said um, I just don't know why but I feel like we need to stay connected and literally for years I, I got him dressed for dates we were the best best of friends oh, so y'all became homies homies like he knew the tot tot before people. As a matter of fact, when I released my album Smile, he was playing at a church and you know how churches play worship music yeah. before the service. The song came on and people started singing my song all over the church. And he called me and said, do you know that these people singing your song everywhere? Like, how did they know you? I was, I was thinking this he has no clue. For real, he just didn't know. He, did he, was, he, know. he was that detached. During that time, Kenny was touring with a lot of R&B artists. So he traveled with Anthony Hamilton oh, to yeah. Mia. So he, was, he, was detached he just from all had not been in, in an, he had just not been in a worship setting yet <laughs> be, to know that Smile had been taken off. So it's the way that God worked it out, you know, and we spent years where even with our friendship, after he got married, we just kind of lost touch for a while. And then after he went through a season of, of darkness and, and he got a divorce, and depression and then we could reconnect he, he sent me a message one day I, I need my friend and then after that it was like okay y'all have been crazy all this time not knowing that you love each other like it was one of those stories for real did you love him I or, did or did you look at him as like oh just my homeboy I did both it was it but was, was it so was it any romantic feelings like when you first met him was there you know how you feel that little tingle or that little spark mm -hmm. or whatever. It was just like, who is this we guy? Cool. This the guy that fixed pra uh, praises what I do, so I wouldn't get chewed out. <laughs> I mean, cool. I would. He would date these girls, and I'd be like, she crazy. You. They, he was going to all these like meetings and stuff. Like this is crazy. So, so during that whole time, it still wasn't no romantic feeling. You no, just like we, you wasn't like, man. She don't know how to appreciate him like I would. Nope. That I never. <laughs> I don't know why. And I, I just, it, I guess it took both of us experiencing more life. 
before we realized that we had tools that each one of us needed for the other. Yeah. Yeah, it took time. So I, I and I will be an advocate for people who say don't rush things because we needed that season of friendship for the strength that we have in our marriage right now. We needed that. Listen, I need y'all to receive that right there. Yes. Yeah. I always talk about that. I always talk about um, um, I want to go from friend to fiance. Mm-hmm. And what that means to me is that you have such a strong friendship. Because in the Bible, you didn't have all that stuff. You didn't have no girlfriend, no boyfriend. You didn't have none of that stuff. You know what I'm saying? You, they when you were was suitors. engaged, you was yeah, married. You, you was married. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like you had suitors. That's yeah. it. Mm-hmm. And so at the end of the day, you, you hit the nail on the head because when you have a foundation of friendship, Ooh. when the marriage get rocky, when you don't yes. like each other when you're annoyed you can go back to that friendship yes. and every couple that I have that has built a solid friendship that's been on this podcast they'll say I don't want to talk to my wife right now I want to talk to my best friend, friend. Yep. and when you said when he called you up and said I need my friend right Ooh. now ah, yeah yep yeah so during that phone call when did it start turning when did it turn from when y'all reconnected As friends, what made it start turning? Because it was no longer surface. That it unlocked another space of transparency and depth with both of us. Because though he was sharing that he was in a dark place, I was too. You know, and the world didn't know that. They knew, hey, this is the girl that's on the stage and she's making us happy and she's making us smile. But I would go home for days and be in the dark, plagued by anxiety and fear. And so to have that one person who could also relate to one person, not just a person, somebody I can trust, somebody yes. that I knew that wasn't going to go out and expose that y'all part. singing her songs, but she's dealing with, you know, <laughs> I was safe. Both of us were, were safe. And that unlocked another space in our relationship. Were you dating around that time? I was not dating. I, I I I didn't have the capacity. I was just so it was a really dark place. It Were a you a dater season. at any point? Like even when you met him, he got married during that season where you dated, were you almost I close to not. marriage with nobody? I was not, I was probably one of them people too consumed with Working. life and work and you know I, looking back I, and I went through therapy even for this because I was also always a person who lived for what's next so like we'll we'll talk about this in a few minutes I, I'm in a new season now but finish writing that book today something happened I I would I wouldn't live to celebrate it I would just be like okay now what's next Wait, did it eat did y'all send out an email did you I lived in in the future but I had to learn how to live in the present and celebrate moments and I think during that season even with Kenny I remember going through therapy I want to share this and the therapist told me to do something with my closest friends and my loved ones she was like I need you to make them make you be present so like to this day, if I'm living too far in the future, Kenny will make me sit down and say, how do you feel? Do you have a headache? You know, do your feet hurt? How, how do you feel? Like, they make me be present. Like I, I loved that was one of the things that really shifted my life and made me live in the present. I think too many times we live in a ambitious go getter kind of world where, where we don't stop to celebrate what God is doing right now. So let me tell you something. <clears throat> you speaking. Um, last year, I was very intentional on doing that with myself yeah. mm-hmm. because that was the thorn in my side for several years. When I was touring shows across the country, I don't have a lot of pictures for me touring my plays. Wow, yeah. I, used to be a, I used to tour national plays across the country and I, and, um, I don't be having no pictures to show for it. I don't nothing be having to nothing show for it. Because the promoters be like, we got to make sure next market, we got to mm-hmm. make sure we gross in this and gross in that. And I was in this performance mentality. Ooh. And so it just kept me, I couldn't even celebrate. And I had the biggest migraines during that time. Oh, I would get off the stage, sit down in my hotel room. I wear suits and stuff. I started touring shows when I was 23 years old. Yeah. And I would sit down and I would fall asleep in about five seconds. Oh, my and goodness. I would wake up with alligator shoes on, full <laughs> suit on. And I'm waking up just fully dressed. And I'm like, that was horrible sleep Mm -hmm. and that would happen so often and so last year I kept saying I'm gonna start celebrating milestones in my life so if I hit a certain number on YouTube I'll go buy me a little gift to take myself out to eat if I if I get you know Tasha Cobb on the podcast and I'm gonna go celebrate that today (laughs) I'll be like you know what God thank you for doing that because oftentimes we'll pray prayers and we'll see it manifested and we keep living through it yeah God said I just 
Remember? See in the Bible They would stop To build an altar You better talk about it Listen And so that's what I used to use Girl you all You all in my business <laughs> That's what I would use To celebrate me yeah. I said God When God did stuff uh, In the Bible They would stop And build a, uh, an altar In remembrance And say mm-hmm. God I remember This season in my life Ooh. You did this for me So I'm gonna build something As a memorial To remind me Of what you did wow. But now we just go From one moment to the next and Be like mm-hmm. oh, oh hey, Thank you Next thing Next thing Performance based mm-hmm. And so that's your Beautiful altar That's sitting on yeah. that table Right there Yeah of the manifestation of tears and and as you bled on these pages, wow. you know what I'm saying, and and to remind yourself to be present and not go. All right, well, let's see. Yeah. I need to go do the next book. Girl, mm-hmm. the first book ain't came out yet. I you know, right? <laughs> well, I need to start yep. working on my next. Like you just mm-hmm. be present and celebrate that. So I thank you so much for actually sharing that. Wow. Um, and now you've taught me to even be more intentional to to tell my friends and family to remind me remind to be present. Remind me to be present. Remind me. Yeah. He said, do your feet hurt right now? Yeah. Cause, Talk about it, Tosh. Because I got arthritis in my toes. <laughs> and he just said, do your feet hurt? Do your feet hurt? That That is, you know what? It's funny, but it is literally. It's real. It's real. Like, oh, uh, it makes you be present. It makes me stop to think, am I in pain? Because, you know, sometimes we can, us workaholics and we'll people that. work straight through it. And you won't even realize that you're in pain right now. Like you, you're not feeling good. You don't, you don't even remember. You don't even recognize that you're hungry. You haven't eaten all day. You just be working, singing. You be like, I haven't yeah. eaten nothing all day. You yes. know, so you have to remind yeah. yourself of the simple things mm-hmm. in life. And it sounds crazy, but it's something that we have to remind ourselves. Yeah. And, and I really even feel, I feel like right now that it's a tool that the enemy uses to keep us from focusing on the greatness of God. Like if you establish reminders and monuments and altars, you always have a place to go back to remind you just of how good he is. Sometimes we can get in seasons that are challenging. And because we don't have reminders, we never stop to build a monument or to build an altar. (laughs) We don't have anything to come back to show you. No, he was good then. And he's going to be good again. I think you just wrote your I think you just wrote your next song. That's the next song. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Build an altar. That right there, boy. Yes. It's something on that. Wow. It's something on that. Y'all got to do that. Yeah. You have to stop to recognize when God has done something in your life. And I think, and culture will tell you, well, church culture will tell you, you ain't supposed to celebrate. But the Bible says something totally different. <laughs> wow. Woo. Couldn't nobody be Jesus telling you who he was. <sighs> He said, I am the way. I am. He would tell you. Listen, and this if you is got it am. wrong, he'll say, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? <laughs> he was like, let me remind y'all real quick. And this, hey, I, I ain't bragging. I'm just telling the truth. It's who I am. Let me ask you this. Did Ooh. you have a problem celebrating yourself? I did. At what point yes. did it finally click to say, I'm going to celebrate what God has done? It was around that same time because I, I think you just carry so much weight of being great or being successful or completing the next task that you don't really stop to celebrate what God has done through you and and how he will use you. You know, I think it's, it is, how do I say this? It is a honor. It is an honor for God to choose to use your gifts, whatever they are. Yes. And I think it's a slap in the face when we say, I'm not going to celebrate what God gave me or how God chooses to use me. When God is like, I want you to praise me for this. Do you remember what you did in celebration of yourself? Ooh. For me, it's rest, vacationing. That's how I celebrate. Like, hey, all right, now you can take some time off. You can take some time away. And I wasn't always like that. Like right now, we actually put it on our calendars so that we, you know, because you have a tendency to skip over it. 100%. Like, oh, those three days can wait. We can do it next month. The yep. next month never comes. Yeah. So you take vacations. We do. You go travel. I have one plan right now. When is it? When is it? Where y'all <laughs> when going? When we come off this tour, I have a couple things um, happening right in the next couple weeks after that. And then we're going on. Um, we're going to take four days. Just four days to breathe. It's going to be Put out the country somewhere? Up. No. I'm yeah. going to stay in the country. Is it hard for you to get out the country? I'm not an out the country kind of person. Why not? Because I need to be able to get back to Asher. <laughs> I need to get to Asher quick. <laughs> yeah, get back to my baby. <laughs> my baby boy. <laughs> is it hard for you to be away? It is. It is. I Right now, we've been on tour for um, 30 cities. And Asher's two and a half. 
So that's been tough because he started school while I was gone. I did get to take him on his first day. So that was great. Um, So it's just been kind of tough watching how he's grown so quickly, just being around other children, being in school. And I have to watch it on FaceTime. But somebody told me something that I'll never forget. Um, It's a pastor. Her name is Fanika Friend. And she said to me, um, when God equipped you, he equipped them for the life that you were called to live. And so I always keep that. At the forefront so you won't of my be so mind, guilty yeah. of, of, of the mom of the guilt. guilt, yes, yeah. that he's equipped for this. All right, we're gonna keep it because you know you start talking about the kids, we can talk about Ooh, that. I'm gonna babies. come back to that. We're gonna unpack. We're gonna build to that. Mm-hmm. So when did it happen to where the romance came into y'all friendship? I love this because this is about to be so Tasha. One night, I just told him, I said, "You got feelings for me." <laughs> <laughs> Said, you have feelings for me. Now, how well, bold is that? Why can't I just say I got feelings for you? Because you, you had to project it. And that was good that you did it like that. I sure did. Because it wasn't like you were pursuing him. You made him confess his own. <laughs> that he wanted to pursue me. Right? I helped him out. You helped I gave him, him some you help. Gave, you gave him an alley-oop. And you said, you told him, you told him. Uh, he you got feelings, feelings for me. what he said? He could not disagree. I said, I, I think we need to discuss this. We're going to have to talk about this. <laughs> It was the truth. Look at us now. Come on, seven years down the road. <laughs> Ladies, that's Ladies, a little tip. Yeah, tell them. Tell you're not, you're tell not being too aggressive. You're just like helping. It's you, helping. We you, call to be help. <laughs> we call to help, right? Yeah, y'all supposed to be the help, mate. Yeah. And so you told him how he felt about you. Yes. <laughs> and he and said- he couldn't disagree. He just said what? We, we actually just discussed it over the next couple of days. It was a few days. Because he had to think about that thing. It was, you know- that is something like that to catch you off guard. <laughs> I, I, if, if I, I'm that kind of person. If I muster up the boldness and the strength, I'm going to say it. It's just, it's, you just do it. Sometimes you just got to do it anyway. <laughs> How long did y'all date before the proposal? It was years. Years? Yeah. yeah. So about two years because Kenny actually, um, he was married before. Right. So he has two, chi- two, he has two children from that marriage. Right. And we wanted to make sure that it, the timing was right for the children. Right. Of like course. You always have to, blending families, blend, blending families is important. And it's important that you put the children at the, at the forefront of it. So you were self, you were, you were aware of that yes. even going in. Mm-hmm. And even with, with um, Shia, our, our baby's mom, she's my friend, Shia, we so cool. Um, with her, she allowed me, so Symphony is a baby girl. So Symphony okay. was three years old at the time. And so she allowed me to spend time with Symphony first. So I started with the baby. And Who then, did? The, the ex-wife did? Mm-hmm. Yep. That's mm-hmm. beautiful. Yeah. So we from the beginning, we we had a very, uh, we had great communication. So, so how did that work out? How did that first introduction to his ex-wife work out? Like she's like, because that sounds very healthy. Oh, no, me. no. We, it sounds very healthy. <laughs> sounds very healthy. And you know what? We had, we had some un- unhealthy seasons and we had some very hard conversations. Right. But at the end of the day, all of us committed to making sure that our kids had the best parental experience yes. and I think having a bonus mom yes. we all, we teach them that like y'all just got extra yes. you know and so it wasn't always that way but I will never forget this there was a podcast with Will Smith uh, Jada Pinkett and Will Smith's oldest son's mom they did an interview together and in the interview uh, the mother was talking about how Jada loved her son so much that it made her love Jada and our baby's that. mom, she sent me that um, that that interview, and she said, "This is how I feel." She was like, I, "I've not been able to articulate it until I saw this." You broke down and she crying. Said, didn't you? All of us, both of us, was just a mess. <laughs> she said, "The way that you love my children makes me want to love you." Ooh. And from that, yep, from that conversation until now, we worked tirelessly. To make sure that our relationship is as healthy as it can be so that our kids have the best parental experience ever. Do you realize what y'all did for those kids? Mm. See, they don't have the, they, they're not going to grow up with the testimony of, yeah, my mama don't like my, yeah, my dad and new wife and they this, mm-hmm. this. I got to walk on eggshells. I got to pretend like I really don't like my, my, my bonus mom mm-hmm. because my mom is jealous of that. So yeah. I got to act like I don't like her wow. when I'm around her. And then yeah. I got to act like, and they just learn so how to act. So many different act. dynamics. Yeah, all yeah. that crazy stuff. They mm-hmm. can just be healthy. Yeah. And the fact that she was so self-aware enough to know that 
she could see that you don't have any ill intentions yes. and that you truly love Damn her kids yep. so much that she says, I can't help but love you because yes. I see how much you love my kids. That is mm -hmm. beautiful. Yep. When mm -hmm. I say I want that to resonate with everybody that's watching mm -hmm. this episode, those that have um, families that mm -hmm. didn't go ideal, the traditional uh, mm -hmm. nucleus family or whatever, where you have the, the I hate to say baby mama, baby daddy mm -hmm. situation, but, well, but y'all not living in the same household yeah. with your kids or whatnot, that you can still have a healthy yeah. parental dynamic if you work with It requires a lot it. of selflessness. Uh, a lot. Yep. Yeah. A lot. And I want to say this and from the beginning, it wasn't always that way, but I have to give all of us do. We give kudos to Kenny, the way that he managed all of us so well, like he would lean in where he felt more of his energy needed to be. And then he would pull away when he felt like, OK, they have to experience this on their on their own. He would allow us to have our conversations when he needed to interject. He would interject even with the kids, the way that he would sit down with each one of them, because he tells it this way that he's also a bonus father. So he would went through that so with his um with his first marriage our middle son our, our oldest son is from his first marriage so that's his bonus son but yeah. they're all our children and so he, he, he from experience he says so i've been on both sides of this and i understand what it takes to manage both dynamics and so he did so well in allowing us allowing us to have our space but also interjecting wisdom when it needed to be there kenny let me tell you something. He's the guy. <laughs> I salute you, King. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. Yeah. That's what, that's what, that's the epitome when the Bible says you are the priest of your home. Yes. That's what he did. Mm -hmm. That's what he cultivated. That's what he curated. Yeah. And it's like, it's, uh, we can yeah. go on and on about that because yeah. I believe that as men, as leaders, that's what we, that's how we model leadership like yes. that. If you can set the tone in your household to be like, hold on, we're not going to be doing this. Yep. We're not going to be doing this. This is what we're going to do together. Then women, they they will acquiesce to that mm -hmm. to that that masculine energy. Yep. And you, let me tell you, that's what he did. Because there would be times where each one of us we want to say something. <laughs> I want to, you know, you how you want to get back. You want to yeah. get back. And he would be like, "That's not how we handled it. What's how is that?" He would use words like, "How is that going to help us to progress?" If you say that that way, you're saying that from emotion, not in a way that's wise enough to help us build our family dynamic. I mean, literally, he talks like that. Kenny, Kenny, I'm going to tell you this right quick. You ask God if this agrees with you, but you need to be writing a book about that. You need to Truly. write a book about co-parenting. And that would be absolutely powerful because I believe that especially our culture as African-Americans could, man, you would be doing a great service yeah. to us to learn that because that would be that would that would be a generational shift yeah. because that. That's what's happening in our culture is that we have all this not you see it on social media all the time. It's yeah. crazy. You'll see prime example, even when it comes to Sierra and, 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 and Russell, you'll hear them try to throw. I mean, you hear people on social media be throwing uh, who, who, who's a baby daddy. Uh, what's the man's oh. name? Uh, Future. future, future, you know, all that. Why can't it just be healthy? Why can't it be healthy? Like he, Russell says, listen, I am going to parent your son like it's my own. Yeah. You know, why can't it be that and it be okay yeah. and not become toxic with all yes. this type of stuff? We live in a culture where people just love toxic. They love, <laughs> we have to make everything toxic. Why can't everything just, some things are just it's good. It's good. It's I good. It didn't work out in this situation, and but it's okay. working out in this situation. Yep. Yep. It's not the how y'all plan it to be, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's work. <laughs> yep. it's, 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 it's working out. All yep. things work together for the good yes. of them that love God to the call according to his purpose. Why can't it be I that? Love it. So I love that that Kenny was very instrumental in doing that to mm -hmm. make sure that y'all like y'all level set and he yeah. cast vision. Yeah. And that's the thing about being a leader is casting vision over your household where you say, hey, listen, this is this is this is counterproductive to yeah. the, to the end result. It is, and that's that's uh, yeah. I get yeah. excited about that stuff. And so y'all dated for two years mm -hmm. before the famous question: Will you marry me? How'd that happen? It was private, and our wedding was actually private too. I can't wait to get there. So we were actually watching a movie, just sitting at the house watching a movie, and. He gets up off the sofa and I'm like, what is really happening? Because you're not, I, I told you, I didn't have any idea of expectations it. whatsoever, which I think was probably great for him. Yeah. You know, and he just, he just shared his heart with me that, you know, there's nobody else for me. I choose you for the rest of my life. You know, y'all know, you know, the little spills y'all yeah, do. Yeah, that's beautiful. And he asked me, would I, would I marry him? Yep. It was just me and him. And what did you say? Absolutely. Yes. 
Absolutely. You have to think yes. about it. You have to say, I, I'll give it. Listen, I gave him a yes before I gave him a yes before I found him. Logical reasons say, say no. no. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And we went to, we prepared a, a wedding. One of the things that we both wanted because we lived such a, um, a life that was in front of the people, we wanted it to be private. And so we sent out dinner invitations for a New Year's dinner to all of our close friends and family that Kenny and Tasha want you to join them for a dinner. They did not know. I'm talking to me. The only people that knew were our parents and team members. So when people showed up to this venue, I wanted them when they wrote, when they pulled up, the first thing I wanted them to see was a wedding cake. So they thought they were coming to eat. And literally when you drive up, there's valet and a wedding cake in the window. And they're wow. like, no, they didn't. Wow. All of my aunts, we call them the Golden Girls, my mom's <laughs> sisters. They're like, no, look what I got on. What, what, yeah. Why you didn't tell me it was a wedding? <laughs> you know? But that's how we wanted it. That's we wanted good. it to be the people that we knew would celebrate and pray for us, not just for this one event, but for the rest of our lives. Yes. And so we had friends that were there who stood with us. They made a commitment to challenge us in seasons and to make sure that we, we, we uh, were faithful to this, to this marriage. It was exactly what we wanted. Exactly. So we had about a hundred people in the room. Yeah, it was, it was beautiful. And who was the officiant? Bishop Brian Pierce, uh, that's Kenny's spiritual father um, from Mount Zion in Greensboro, North Carolina. Used to yeah. sing with Men of Standard. Yes. 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 Brian Pierce, that's our spiritual father. Men of yep. Standard. Mm -hmm. I'm singing. Boy, they say they Ooh, singing for Ooh, wasn't they Lord. tough? Jesus. Goodness. Ooh. Isaac Men Korea. Of oh, God. Oh. My goodness. Shout out to Isaac. I yeah. was just with him a couple of uh, weeks ago in Atlanta. Yes. But yeah, man. that's Love yeah. Ike. Man, so, so. Private ceremony. Y'all mm -hmm. were both in alignment with that. Y'all yes. both wanted the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so y'all take it that you're not a big showy type of woman no. where you need it all. Uh, mm -mm. Where'd that come the from? fanfare. Yeah. I mean, did, did, did you have any, you know, family members? I know you say your aunts, the Golden Girls made some comments, but did, did anybody feel like, well, I wish slide you would. Yeah, slide it from it. Did they? I don't think so. Okay, good. I think it was their expectation just knowing me. Yeah, you know, I, me and my mom, we laugh about it all the time. She can't think of one time that me and her ever sat down and did a, a what you, a collage of what Tasha's wedding gonna look like. It just, it just, I, and you know what? I never really thought of it this deep until this conversation. I just, just, <laughs> just, I knew I was gonna get married. Didn't know why, how, didn't expect. You know, I might not be the right person for this podcast. <laughs> no, you're the perfect person. You're the perfect there person. There are some people like that. Because yeah, that's but see, that's because sometimes people. They I they idolize marriage, but they don't put enough emphasis on the. I mean, they idolize the, the wedding, wedding, but they don't put enough emphasis on the marriage. Yes. And so I don't see see anything wrong with that. Nothing. My daughter was the same way. Really? So my daughter got married a year and three months ago, uh -huh. and I man, I made up in my mind how her wedding gonna be. You fixed it up, man. I picked the venue. <laughs> I did all this stuff. I said we're gonna do this, and then one day she stopped. She said, "Daddy, that's that's not what that's I want." That's not what I want. I said, "What you mean? That's not what what we want." Yes. She yep. said. Well, me and, and and my fiance Tay, we want something simple. Yes. You're gonna have all these people, your friends there. We don't know uh -huh, the people. Uh -huh. You know, she said, I just want about 20 people, people I you know. You even made it a production. I said, Yeah, I said, your daddy is a producer. <laughs> what are you? I felt slighted. I already had planned our first dance. You like, we don't gonna, do this to me. Don't do this to me. <laughs> I'm getting married. What is wrong with you? Why can't you do this? She was like, oh, I don't, I don't goodness. need all that. Yep. Mm -hmm. My daughter got married. I love the, it. So I booked the venue originally and um, she told me not to do it. She said, listen, I don't want that. That's too big. Yeah. So I gifted on the, in the first year of my podcast in 2020. Uh, I did a, uh, um, um, it's called Black Love Matters mm -hmm. where I sponsored three couples getting married. So I used yeah. that venue to say, I, I can't let it go to waste. So me and my team, we got together and we sponsored three couples to have a wow. group wedding. But that's because my daughter didn't want to do the wedding there. <laughs> so oh. then I had to gift it with other people. So yeah. I was like, this is some nonsense. So she, she, at first she was going to do a destination wedding. Later on, she ended up getting married in the clubhouse of her apartment. Wow. That was it. It was a little, it was a clubhouse. See, I love stuff Order like some this. Uh, Olive Garden. Her mama paid for the Come Olive, on, Garden. Olive Garden. It was just I real simple. It. I said, this is so simple. Yeah. And she was like, but I still cried the same. Yep. When Ooh. I was standing there about to give away, I still cried the same. Come on. I looked in the eyes and I was like, this is beautiful. Yeah. Because it was what she, she wanted. wanted. Mm -hmm. You know? And um, and it was just, it was just beautiful. So I love the fact that, you know, it ain't like you couldn't afford it. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it wasn't about, like, yeah. You're like, I don't need all that. This is going to be what we wanted. Yeah. And the fact that y'all were aligned in that. Yes. And it's beautiful. And the fact that you said, no, I didn't have Thank you, Holy Spirit. You didn't have it all picked out about what he was going to look like, what mm-hmm. he's going to be, what age is going to be. You yeah. literally surrendered to the Holy Spirit yes. guiding you whenever that date was going to come, right. whoever it was going to be, mm-hmm. however, whatever his profession is going to be. You just said, I'm surrendered. Yeah. Absolutely. That's the most powerful thing that I want people yeah. to take away from it because people get into depression because they didn't get married the time that they they wanted. They wanted. Yes. It was like I was supposed to be married by now. Were you really? Wow. Were you really yep. supposed to be married by now? Mm-hmm. If you said that God will order your steps and that step hadn't been ordered yet, so, so was you really supposed to be married by now? Yeah. Yeah. I was 36. 36. 36, yeah. And I mean, uh, to a lot of people, that's late. It's a lot of people at 30, they start <laughs> cringing. Like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. You know, and I would just encourage a lot of women to submerge yourself, number one, into your relationship with Christ. And I know we don't want to hear that. You think it's so deep, it's so yeah. churchy, but you would be surprised how fulfilling that is. And it's not so much about staying in the Bible. Stay, you submerging yourself in your relationship with Christ can be, hey, take yourself out, hang out with your girls, you know, find yourself, c- create, a, make yourself a wife. There it is. Make yourself a wife. And I don't mean the cooking and cleaning. I mean, be whole. There it is. Be happy with yourself. There it is. Like the way that you look. You know, take care of yourself. Find yourself engulfed into your career and into your ministries, whatever, you, whatever you're called to do. Like, there are so many other things to do than to sit around and allow, allow the enemy to make you get depressed. Because so many people get into a, a place of depression because we yep. get in our heads. Yep. Yeah. You just preached. Let me ask you this real quick. <laughs> Because you talked about a real thing. You get 36 mm-hmm. years old mm-hmm. at 35, doctors telling you you're going to have a geriatric pregnancy. Yep. And so it becomes real with, with women who uh, desire kids that doctors or gynecologists are telling them, hey, listen, hey, what, you know, what we doing? Yeah. Yep. How did you deal with that uh, in your pregnancy? I mean, in, in your in your marriage? You know what? Um I think I've always felt that there was something that I needed to have some doctors to pay attention to and I didn't really put a lot of attention to it until after we got married so for two years you know we tried to have a baby and I was like okay this is not working I feel you know you feel this emptiness you feel like there's something going on so I went to a doctor in Houston and we found out that I had um, a severe case uh, of endometriosis. Mm-hmm. And so the endometriosis was preventing us from um, conceiving. So we decided, hey, well, let's do whatever it takes to fix it because you got all these prophecies, you mm-hmm. know, everybody's saying y'all going to have this baby, this baby, this baby. And we believed it, you know. And so we went to Houston. We would fly to Houston once a month for a year. To, mm. you know, just do the math, y'all. Once a month for a year, we would get these injections to clear endo- endometriosis out of my body. And when it was clear enough, uh, we felt like the doctors would say, y'all have a window, just yep. a window of opportunity, just a few months where you can do um, IVF and, and have an embryo implanted. Um, so we went through with IVF. We, we, we had one embryo, you know, one embryo and we implanted the embryo and we lost that baby. And so can you imagine I'm thinking, okay, we have a promise from God. Mm. I don't have enough eggs to do this again. Um, We lost the one embryo that we have. So where is this miracle coming from? You know, and I, I feel like there are so many people and I feel like so many people can relate to this story because whether it's a natural child or a spiritual, something that God has called you to birth, some of us feel like we're in a place where we just don't understand. Like, why is this not happening how God said it would happen? And I and in my story now, I couldn't have told this that way back then because I was so grieved and depressed and hurt and confused. But now that I've allowed God to give me revelation behind it, it was God saying, babe, I told you you were going to have a baby. But you tried to go do it your way. You know, and I've shared this several times. Sometimes we hear God's will but we go and try to do it our way. And so our way was you go get IVF, you go clear out endometriosis. And God is saying, but I've already created this human being, this beautiful baby boy that I have designed just for y'all, but you got to do it my way. And so one day Kenny came to me and he said, um, this was months after we lost the baby. And he said, babe, what do you think about adoption? 
And before I probably would have been totally against it. But this time I, I heard Kenny sharing the word of God to his wife, that this is God's will and, and his way. And so we went through adoption and the long story short is we had an agent who, after we finished all the paperwork, I tell people all the time, I didn't go through labor like every other woman goes through labor, but I went through labor. Like the processes that you have to go through in order to get to the adoption. Yeah. It's just, you know, that it, it, mental, sometimes just thinking, is this going to fall through? Yeah. You know, it, when I get a parent, is she going to change her mind? Yeah. You have to think of all of those things. And so it's labor. And so we went through those months of labor, turned in our paperwork and we submitted it to four adoption agencies. And she said to us, she said, you know, sometimes this could take two years, four years, and sometimes people never get a baby. And she said, but we're going to believe God that you've done all that you're supposed to do and now God is going to do his part. Three days later, three days later, we received a phone call from our agent saying, I don't know how this happened. She said, it's not even an, an agency that you uh, submitted an application to. We don't know how they got your name. What? But a mother walked into this agency and everything about your profile fits what she's asking for this baby. Come and on. she said, um, so you it's between you and seven other families. And she said it could take about two weeks for her to make her decision. And uh, mm. she said it would take about two weeks for you her to make your decision. She said, but I really, really sense in my spirit. This is why it's so Come on. good to have people who can hear from God from you, for you in seasons where you can't hear as clear. Because we got to be honest, there are some seasons where we don't hear as clear. Mm. And just to have her there helping to usher us so gently through this season, especially after experiencing the trauma that we experienced, yes. to have that person there who cared, who understood, but also who knew God. And she said, she, she, she didn't say this to me. She said, Kenny, I want you to sit and write a handwritten letter to the birth mother. And I want you to share with her how this family would be the perfect place for she this baby to boy Kenny. to Kenny. And so my husband went upstairs to the office and he wrote out this letter telling our story about our family, about our other children and how they were excited to welcome another sibling. And the next day. She called us in tears saying. This has never happened in 20 years of me working at this agency. She said the mother called and she chose you guys and your baby boy is being born in four weeks. So this whole time we had been in labor, we had been carrying this baby. It just wasn't the way that we thought it was God's way. We got my baby boy. What was the, um, what was the uh, time span between the loss of the embryo and the, um, the phone call that you had? How long were, was that? You know, I don't know the exact time, but I would say it was between seven to nine months. That's why I felt in the spirit. Yep. That's why I asked you that. I need to get that exact number, but I really believe it was between seven to nine months. That's why. Because the process takes six months just to get all the paperwork and everything done. So when you add it up, that's... That's why I just heard in the spirit. Um, mm -hmm. And it just shows me how awesome God is, how intentional God Jesus. is. The Bible says, if you know how to give good gifts as pretty much Ooh. humans, what more do you think your heavenly father how can do for more? you? How much more? And so when I listen to that, especially me being a, an adoption and foster care advocate, I actually sit on the board for an adoption agency. Shout mm -hmm. out to Advantage Adoption. Yeah. Um, but yeah, these stories right here, they hit me differently. Jesus. Because... Yeah. People have no idea about how intentional God is yeah. because God knows that you and Kenny have exactly what that Ooh. child needs. And when a mother decides to give up her child, 
And it's not really giving up in that sense. It's like the story of Moses. It's like mm-hmm. saying, listen, I, I believe that it is my assignment. Yes. My assignment mm-hmm. because she has just been led by God because you are praying a prayer mm-hmm. and she is praying a prayer simultaneously yeah. because she knows what she, the resources or whatever she mm-hmm. has that is causing her to give up the yeah. child. You're praying a prayer because you're saying, God, this is what we need in our life. And mm-hmm. we, and it's a prophecy that went for way before this moment. Yeah. And these prayers, Prayers are happening simultaneously wow. and it takes two people to be obedient wow. to the voice of God in order for this miracle to take place. Mm-hmm. When I Ooh. tell you the mm, hand of God, mm, mm, mm. the hand of God. Jesus. And I'm telling you, and I like what you said that no, we didn't, we didn't go through a physical child uh, labor. labor or whatever, Ooh. but oh, we went through some it labor because people don't know what you got to go through with yes. all that. Man, they start doing, they come and, and mm-hmm. investigate and do background so checks and do this stuff yeah. and do home studies and all this other yes. stuff. And you sit around and be like, God, no, yeah. like, mm-hmm. Lord, geez. Yep. it's so easy. It's so much easier just to go uh, uh, take some sperm and an egg and have your own <laughs> kid than take, to literally be going back. You're like, God, no, what you think I'm doing? Oh, yeah. I mean, they will, yeah. you be like, y'all just went mm-hmm. doing a whole background check and everything for on everybody. On everybody mm-hmm. in the household. Mm-hmm. You'd be yeah. like, good yeah, Lord. Truly, truly. Which is so necessary. It is so necessary, yeah. But the fact that you had to go through that. Yep. And and that's the beautiful thing about what you'll be able to tell your child is I chose you. I chose you. I tell them every day. <sighs> yes. Mommy and daddy choose you every day. Yep. <sighs> Three years old. Yeah. Um, had them since birth. Yep. Day one. How do you feel being a mother? Oh, my goodness. It's the most beautiful assignment. It is the most beautiful assignment for God to entrust you with a gift. Like, it's his gift. And God is saying, okay, I put all of these things inside this little tiny person that's going to grow up to be a big person. But it's your job to cultivate it. What God so, moments do you see in him? Oh, so many. Asher shows us so much about ourselves. For one, you know, Tasha lighten up. Just you know, lighten up. It is not that serious, you know? And he is that. He's like such, such a comedian. <laughs> He's so wise to be two and a half. Like the other day I was doing, oh, I'll tell this one. I was getting my nails done and the nail tech has known him since he was, born basically and he's he's just now developing all of this language sentences all of this kind of stuff and so she sees it every time she comes and it's just getting he's getting better and better at it so Asher was standing there and he was just talking to me just talk talk talking and she was amazed like when did he start talking like this so he stood there and he just smirked at her and then he said I can talk (laughs) he's like such this like that that and it is just it might be minor to some people but to me it just teaches me Tasha enjoy life lighten up you know as that's what Asher teaches us he's so so I can talk he's so he did he said I can talk (laughs) after this is after he laughed at her for being amazed then he said I can talk like this little boy he is just he is his name is Asher and it means laughter so every morning he wakes up with this big smile on. He lives up to his name. Yeah. Asher name Amaris. Me and Kenny both. So we chose Asher, which means laughter. And then his middle name, uh, a gift from God. Mm. Yeah. Is his mom present? I mean, his biological mom, is she still present? She's not. Uh, she's not. But you know what? We had a great conversation. We actually had an opportunity to talk to her twice. And I didn't say that in that conversation when she chose us, Kenny asked her, what was the thing that made her choose us? And her response was, when I read your letter, the baby started kicking. And so she said, I didn't choose you. He did. Yeah. Tasha, yeah. Tasha, yeah. Yeah. So in those Good two Lord. conversations, Jesus. that was one of the conversations we had with her. Yeah. She said, I didn't choose you, the baby. He did. did. Mm-hmm. Do you t- the people don't believe in God? Let me tell you something. You, Listen, you gotta you're be missing hard. Out. <laughs> you gotta be hard pressed <laughs> to try to go go ahead and make sense out of that. Go yeah. and say, Oh, it's just a coincidence if you want to. You try to figure it out. <laughs> Only God. <laughs> Only there's some things that the answer to that is. <laughs> Only God. Only God. Yeah. Only God. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. And, and and 
So for those that are even considering adoption or or uh, foster care or whatnot, or they just, you know, they may feel like, well, that's still not going to feel like that's my child. Mm -hmm. I want you to speak to that. I want you to speak. Turn that camera and say, I want you to eradicate that that, that, that thought. I I feel like the fear of the unknown is what uh, causes a lot of people in our culture to to not pursue it. But let me just, I'll be a testimony. I could not love my baby anymore had I birthed him naturally. He looks like me. He walk like us, act like us, talk like us. When you do it God's way and, and you really sense that this is the way that God wants you to do it, I promise you that the gift that he gives to you, you are going to love it like it came from your loins. I mm. promise you that. Yep. <sighs> so you got this amazing book that you've written. Yeah. What's the name of this book? Do It Anyway. Why did you name it that? Ooh, I'm going to tell this really quick. I, um, in 2013, I released the album Grace. Um, that, that album was nominated for six stellar awards and one Grammy, all within a span of seven days. And my father was a down home country preacher. He pastored a church. He started when I was 10 years old. This is the kind of family we were. We went on vacation from Sunday evening to Saturday. So we could be back on the church on Sunday. <laughs> My daddy was going to be the last one in the church. He was going to uh, turn off the, the air and the lights because that bill wasn't going to be high. He was a down home country, country preacher. But the Stellars were happening on a Sunday. And I was I was trying to condition myself that daddy's not going to be at the Stellars. But my daddy showed up to the Stellars. He came and. um to, that, I tell people now that was more of, of an award, a reward than anything I could have got that night to look out and see my parents in the room. And so daddy was there. I won six stellars that night. That night he came to, we were in Bishop Murphy's room, just laughing in the Kiki King. I couldn't believe he was in Nashville. And I really didn't feel like he was going to come at two o'clock in the morning to come laugh with us. He had us up all night laughing and, and joking around. And then he left at about four o'clock in the morning. And my father was a carpenter like Jesus. So he had built this curio. <laughs> to put all his baby girls awards in that he believed I was going to win. And so my repayment to him for being executive producer on my first album was you get the awards. I'm never going to pay you back. I'm never going to pay. <laughs> and so, so four o'clock that morning, my dad left the hotel room, just laughing and playing with us. And I saw him beaming with pride. He was holding all of my awards in his hands. And I said, take one of them out, daddy. I'm going to snap a picture with you. And uh, he took it out and he was smiling from ear to ear and he held it up. I snapped a picture of him and that was my last time seeing him. He went home to be with the Lord the next day. And I will, I'll tell you this. Um, during that week, he would say to me, daddy's not going to be with you in LA, but I want you to go anyway. And so I was thinking, nobody expects you to come to L.A. You go to Nashville, that's enough. And he just kept saying, Daddy's not going to be with you. Because L.A. was for the Grammys. Yeah, I want you to go anyway. And that was the last lesson my father left with me. That sometimes your heart is going to be broken. Sometimes you're not going to understand it and you're going to be confused. But I want you to dig deep in yourself and get up and do it anyway. So the premise for this book, it came from the last lesson that my dad left with me. I know your heart is broken, but daddy wants you to go to L.A. anyway. And I I won a Grammy that year. And that was the same year where nobody knew what I looked like, but they knew my name and they knew that song, Break Every Chain. It's the same year that my mother's prophecy came to pass. That was the most beautiful story I heard in my life. <laughs> Good Lord, Jesus. Yeah, is absolutely. Well, I know beautiful. we just toe up in here. God, that is so beautiful. <laughs> so that's where we got the book from, and so it's oh just full God. of full of so many uh, stories where I faced challenges in life, stories that I can't tell in a song. God, I had God. to write these. I had to write it out. Yeah. Yeah, mess me up. That story is beautiful. So you got Thank a picture you. of your dad. It's like, but think about it's in the book. Can I show yes, you? Yes, please. Yeah, they put that picture in the book. Think about that. Think about if you didn't have the wherewithal to take that picture. I wouldn't have gone to the Grammys either. The only reason I went, I never thought I would win. The only reason I went, and I went upset with him because I was like, why did you keep telling me to go anyway? Go anyway. And I got there and people called my name. I couldn't believe it. That's the picture of him holding this Wow. Down. Mm-hmm. The last picture. Yeah, I snapped it before he left and he had a heart attack and went to be with the Lord the next day. The next day. Mm-hmm. And that's the Grammy. I asked the entire, uh, I asked all of everybody in the Grammys to stand up and give my father a round of applause. 
And they did. I said seven days ago, the greatest man to walk the face of the earth went to be with the Lord. Seven days ago. Mm -hmm. How did you feel being up there? Where did you feel? I mean, because I know he spoke that word over mm -hmm. your life. But I know it was heaviness. Could you actually enjoy that moment? A woman that have a whole, it was a challenge celebrating yes. moments, even with less obstacles in a way. Did you celebrate that moment? I did not. It was just, it was just, a, it was just, I, I, it was a blur, I, huh? I was still living in the future. One of those moments. I felt the weight of the moment and I felt God's strength to be able to stand there and talk about my father and to receive that award. Yeah. But I, I wasn't as present as I could have been. And the way, you know what? God orchestrated it so well for me because um, like a couple of weeks before that, my father met Ty Tribbett at a, at a conference and him and Ty just kicked it off. <laughs> he came back home saying, Ty Tribbett, my best friend. He was, my dad was so funny. He's my best friend. I told Ty, what did you do to my dad? <laughs> and literally Ty was the one who gave, he was standing on stage with me and handed me my Grammy. He announced it. You see what I'm so saying? I was surrounded by safety. Just little glimpses of daddy saying, I'm still here with you. You know, you're safe. You can do this. Ty was standing right there on the stage with me. You see what I'm saying? And we walked off together and Ty just grabbed me. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, this, that's it. Oh, we got two words. Only God. <sighs> Only God. Tasha, the... Um my community, we call them the lit fam because mm -hmm. on the podcast, we live intentionally and transparently. Mm -hmm. And so when we get people that, um, and that's the reason why when people come on my podcast, I don't try to like promote the book mm -hmm. or promote their product. Like yeah. buy this, buy this, buy this. Yeah. They get your story, fall yes. in love with you and then support you with everything you got. They finna wow. start buying a bunch of your songs. People don't even know. <laughs> we, finna, we, we just got to support her. They just go crazy and support like yeah. crazy, which I thank y'all so much thank for y'all being like yeah. that. People come on my podcast, they go, what do you have over there? They say, I've never <laughs> even experienced this before. It's wow. something different. They say, I've been on platforms all the time. I've been on TV. Says, I never get this level of influx. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I said, it's just something that, that God trusted me with yes. in order to foster and curate Mm -hmm. And I thank God for it. But when I wow. tell you, we speak a New York Times bestseller on this thing. Oh, when I, I tell it. you, yes. we yeah, speak yeah. New York Times bestseller over this thing. Wow. The story, the heartbeat around this book. Wow. I don't even... I, I don't even need to go into. I know the the talking points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The publisher company sent yeah, me all yeah. that type of stuff. <laughs> the book is going to be amazing just because it's enough. coming from yeah. you. But just the fact, the heartbeat and the Ooh. posture of it came from that. Oh God, that, mm, mm, that, mm. that messed me up. That wow. absolutely messed me up. And I love that it has photos in there. So it, got, yeah, it has photos photo of different album. moments of what? Yeah, uh, different moments that are in the book. So Asher's in there, our our kids are in there, my mother's in there. Um, I talk about, I tell some stories from when I was younger growing up in church. So it has some pictures of little Tot Tot. Little Tot Tot. <laughs> yeah, my brother, it has just pictures of that album, Grace, that won the um, Grammy. And then I did like discussion questions in the back too, because I know people have like small groups and I'm just yeah. that kind of person. Yeah. Some self-helps kind of stuff. Yeah. You know? So it's literally the story of my life. Let me ask you this, because you just got this book placed in your hand. Uh, that was earlier today. Is it, oh. So how do you feel? Yeah. How do you feel when they place this hard copy in your hand? You know, anybody that's ever carried an assignment, it's like you can breathe. Yeah. Like it's something you hold on to this one breath of, oh, is this going to happen? Or is there going to be a mistake? Is it going to come out right? Is the yeah. print, you know, you're yeah. just making up stuff. Is the print company <laughs> going to explode? Yeah, we, <laughs> yeah, we were thinking about every word you know, that can happen. Every worst thing that can happen. But when they put it in my hands. It became real. It became real. And, and, and it's more the story I just shared. Like I literally get to put my dad's lesson in so many other people's hands. <sighs> Like that's where, and I thought about that and I looked at a picture of him in there and y'all, they had me crying in there with all them people in there. I just, now nah, he got me in here crying. I just, oh, when you hit 40, something else happened. I'm 42 and now I'm just a I'm 46. Of, I turned 46 a couple of weeks ago. Don't you start crying yeah. for no reason? Because you, 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 you grown. You say, you know, yes. I, I, this is my feelings. Ain't nobody yeah. going to make me feel different. Mm -hmm. This is how I feel. And so yes. you just own it. And you have a different appreciation. 100%. Because you can yes. look back and, and remember all that God has brought Ooh. you through. Yeah. And when you look back, and them old folks used to always say it all the time. It's like, you'll understand it better. Bye, bye. 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 you like, what is bye mm -hmm. and bye? <laughs> we, you done know, <laughs> we done now. We done now. We ain't wanted to buy. <laughs> 
And we understand it yes. better. You know, when you look at back at all this stuff or whatever, or they'll say their famous name, you can be falling apart about something that happened. They go, just keep on living. Keep on living. Keep on living. And you you didn't like, want to hear it then, but it makes so much you sense like, now. I'm frustrated about this right now. Yes. Just keep on living. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that when you get to these parts of 30 and 40, and you dealt with heartbreak and you Ooh. deal with disappointments, you deal with things that don't work yeah. back. You look back and be like, guy, if you did it before, you'll do it again. Come Hashtag on, that's the time monument. Tribute. <laughs> That's them altars. You got to look back. Yeah. Look back. And so, man, listen, as we conclude and wrap up, Tasha, let me tell you something. Thank you so much. Um, you're giving me a deeper appreciation of just time wow. and, and an appreciation of taking time. I remember last year I said, I'm a, it's an old saying, they said, uh, take time to smell the roses. Mm -hmm. And so I said that, you know, last year I just stopped and just took time to smell the roses. I, I went to the Bahamas the last year and I was working so much that I don't even remember being in the Bahamas. Like oh, I, I, I yeah. didn't get a chance to chill or do anything. Mm. And so they're booking me to come to the Bahamas um, um, this month. Well, May, Mother's Day weekend. And and they were trying to put some, a lot of stuff on my schedule. I'm supposed to make an appearance out there. And I said, I don't want to do nothing. Don't put just nothing on my schedule. Enjoy I want to enjoy it. This is a beautiful country. Yes. Let me just enjoy it. Mm -hmm. 242 to the world. Let me yes. just hang out and just enjoy it. And so that's what I'm going to do. And so I'm being more intentional yes. uh, of sitting down and just smelling the roses. I love it. But man, that book is going to be amazing. Make sure that y'all purchase this book, Blow Tasha's Mind. It releases wow. May the 7th. Uh, Blow Her Mind. Do they have pre-orders going on? They do. All yeah, right, absolutely. Cool. Everywhere. So, so that's mm -hmm. good. Then I'm going to actually release this yep. episode earlier so that we can get those pre-orders looking amazing wow. on Amazon or whatnot. But um, Thank you yeah, for this. Yeah. It's I have amazing. been so blessed today. For real. But when yeah. I tell you, you got me fooled right now. Like, uh, like I'm going to cry when I get in the car. <laughs> <laughs> um, because this, this it just messed me up. Mm -hmm. Listen, um, you have a concert you got going on, huh? Yeah, you, you on tour. So on let's tour. talk about the tour. One Hallelujah tour. Erica Campbell, Jonathan McReynolds, Israel Holden, Jacqueline Carr. I mean, it is explosive every night. Every night. You yes. got all my people on that tour. You Them got all your all, people. All my people. Yes. All my, Erica was on my podcast before. Jonathan, he's still him. scared to get on the podcast. He <laughs> said, I may one day. I'm scared. Ja Listen, she's supposed Jonathan to come. get up every night. The, the, the women in the room. <laughs> I said all of them think he they husband. Y'all calm down out calm, there. Calm down out there. Yes. You know, Jacqueline, I did her radio show or whatnot. Yes. She's been wanting to uh, come on the podcast. Mm -hmm. I said, let's make time for that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah. And then it's I'm getting Israel great. and his wife on the podcast soon. So I love this it. is going to be dope. You're going to be at the Stellas this year? Yes, we'll good. be at the Stellas. Good, you good. coming? Yeah, I'm going to do yeah. uh, They're talking. I'm going to do a live podcast recording like I did last I year. I love it. Yeah. yeah. So the so live ones be yeah, lit. Man. You say lit. It was fun. It I was fun, it. man. But thank you. Thank you for your support, man. Thank you for Absolutely. all that you do. Thank you for success. I know you got to get running because uh, I see your boy over there looking at his watch. <laughs> and so uh, he like, we got to go. Y'all can keep talking. Y'all call each other on the phone. But listen, thank you so much. I appreciate you. you. Keep doing what you're doing, Tasha. Hey, y'all give it up for my homie, Tasha Cobb. I love y'all. Yeah. Thank y'all. Stay tuned to the end for a letter to my future wifey. Been writing these love letters to you. Ladarian thrusted suddenly into Child Protective Services in 2015. My nephew, black, a boy. The likelihood of being adopted outside of kinship, slim to none. Armani, 16 years old, black, a boy with five years in the foster care system before I even knew his name. The likelihood of ever being adopted? Yep, you guessed it, slim to none. While Ladarian and Armani were trying to survive and barely thrive in an overpopulated and underfunded foster care system, I was living my own life, doing well professionally. Having been a single father with a daughter who at that point was doing well in college, it was my time to live my life, right? Wrong. I felt unsettled, tireless, agitated. There are just too many of our black children stuck in ambiguity and in the limbo of the foster care system. In 2017, I legally adopted my nephew, Ladarian. Fast forward to 2019, I had no ties to this other young king, but I felt God instructed me to adopt him also, and I obeyed. Starting over with parenting should have been enough, right? Working with various foster care and adoption agencies to help bring awareness to the countless young black kings in the foster care system should have decreased my agitation, right? 
joining the board of directors of Advantage Adoption, an organization that helps find permanent adoptive homes for children in foster care, should have led to some type of resolve, right? No, not at all. None of it felt like I had done enough. I now realize that every one of those experiences was laying the fundamental foundation for my life's mission, Kingdom Royale. Kingdom Royale will be a luxury, state-of-the-art home for foster boys. Our first location will be in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. We will utilize the whole person approach that instills identity, empowers them to advocate for themselves, and enlightens them regarding new perspectives and limitless options that they thought were impossible. Though the young kings will attend the local public schools that are in proximity to Kingdom Royale, our at-home curriculum will broaden their worldview through participating in the arts, attending various cultural events, learning about and engaging in multifaceted discussions about current events and even relevant historical contexts, introducing them to gardening and landscaping and even caring for our animals on our farm and on-site stables. We just launched our startup capital campaign with the goal of raising $2.8 million. Now, why $2.8 million? Well, in 2017, I created a web series in which I performed random acts of kindness for targeting the homeless community. One of the most notable successes was that one of the videos went viral, garnering 28 million views. However, one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't raise a single dollar to help in implementing a more sustainable plan for the homeless community. So throughout the years, with much remorse, I reflected on not maximizing that moment. I knew if at that time, just 10% of the viewers donated $1, we would have raised at least $2.8 million that could have really established long-term support for the homeless community, or at least started a long-term initiative to do so. This is my do-over. This is our new beginning. Together, we can attack this at the root by specifically helping our homeless black boys who are already disproportionately represented in the American foster care system. I'm LaTeris R. Whitfield. I've been nominated for three regional Emmys documenting my work with the homeless as well as my personal adoption journey. Despite those accolades, the greatest award for me is truly providing the infrastructure for a transformed life. Visit KingdomRoyale.com for more details. Crown a king and make a donation today. Wasn't this episode absolutely amazing, man? What I love about this episode is that it shows God's divine intervention. We see his divine orchestration of his will, and we see the, the power of surrender. A lot of us don't feel or do, we don't have the heart posture of surrender, but when we truly surrender to the will of God, then we learn how to abase and how to abound, how to live with and how to live without. And then that's where God can show up and show out in our lives. But man, thank you, Tasha, for uh, gracing the Dear Future Wifey podcast with your story of vulnerability and transparency. Well, here's my favorite part of the podcast where I speak to my future wifey. Dear Future Wifey, in a world where challenges seem to lurk around every corner, I've learned that it's not the absence of obstacles that defines our journey, but rather our response to them. There were times when the path seemed treacherous and the weight of uncertainty threatened to overwhelm me. Yet in those moments of doubt and fear, I found solace in surrendering to our Lord and Savior. Surrendering to the will of God doesn't mean giving up or resigning ourselves to fate. Instead, it's about acknowledging that there's a greater plan at work, one that we may not always understand or agree with, but one that ultimately leads us to where we need to be. It's about finding strength and faith and trusting that every obstacle we face is an opportunity for growth and transformation. I believe that our journey together will be marked by its own set of challenges, but I'm confident that with faith as our compass, We'll navigate through them hand in hand. Together, we'll face the storms that threaten to tear us apart, knowing that our love is steadfast and our bond unbreakable. Hmm. Your future hubby. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Dear Future Wifey podcast. Remember, be lit, live intentionally and transparently, and don't stop loving. 
Make sure to subscribe to our Dear Future Wifey YouTube channel. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. We welcome your support. Simply share our podcast with your friends and family.